tonight I want to, to read from, it's supposed to be Romans chapter 6. So the graphic behind me that I made is wrong. So I, forgive me. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 through 24. And I want to talk tonight about promises from faith. What God promises, it is so. I'll be reading from the English Standard uh, translation of this. But verse 20 says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but ours also. I want to focus for a brief moment on verse 20, which says, Paul says, when Paul says, but he, being Abraham, grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now, you might say, like, what is faith? Well, as Webster Dictionary defines it, faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. The Bible, which is better than the Webster Dictionary, says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, if you've spent any amount of time on YouTube looking up different theological arguments or doctrines, you've probably read the comments and seen the phrases, well, Christians believe in God because that's, it's easy for them. They may say, well, that's, their belief in God is them pacifying or numbing the reality of life. But in reality, that is just so wrong. Our faith in God isn't to pacify. We know that things still happen to Christians. Things still happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people all the time. And I wish I had an explanation, but I don't. But I do know that God is bigger than whatever circumstance you may be going through in this time. Faith comes from hearing through the word of God. Romans ten seventeen says, now, your faith can do many of things. It can lead you to pursue a career. It can lead you to, to change careers, to go to school. It can lead you to do all sorts of things. But faith in the wrong thing can lead you to the wrong places. But when you have faith in the God that created you, faith can heal the lame. It says Matthew... 8, 5 through 13, that the faith of that man, by his faith he was healed. Matthew 17, 20, it says that the, you can tell the mountains to move with faith, and they will. Revelation 20 and 12 and Romans 10 and 9, it, faith can keep you from burning in hell for all eternity. And that's ultimately the pinnacle of what faith is. And without faith, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six that it is impossible to please God. Now, I'll get, I'll get on to it a little later, but we're saved by faith. There's nothing that we could do or say or, uh, as Jesus says when the disciples ask him, how do, how do we pray? He says, well, you don't just heap up empty words. Pray like this, because it's not about the eloquency of that which we speak. It's not about, you know, yes, volunteering for to help the homeless or, you know, help the community in your spare time. That's an awesome thing. But don't get it twisted that that alone will not save you. Only faith, the finished work of the cross, will save you. Now, back to Abraham. Unlike today's Christians, Abraham's faith was a little more tried and true, a little more tested and rigid. You know, 
if you've read the Bible, which I'm assuming all of us have, he did not have the testimony of Jesus. Uh, he did not have the stories of Jesus walking on water. He didn't have stories of, of feeding the 5,000. Abraham had a promise. God told him that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. Abraham didn't have the stories of David and Goliath. He didn't have the, the words and the tales of Elijah and Elisha or Daniel in the lion's den, or the prophetic words of Isaiah and Ezekiel. So when decades of trying to conceive a child seemingly were for nothing, all Abraham had was what God said to him. So when times were tough for Abraham, he couldn't pop onto Instagram or to TikTok and get his Jesus fix, you know, the little two-minute motivational devotional that, you know, God loves you, God wants the best for you, see you soon. That's not going to cut it. Paul says that we need to, to put off the milk and start eating the meat. It's, it's so much more than the surface-level stuff that, that some people are putting out. And I'm not dogging other people. That's not my... My thing, but I'm just saying it's true, and it's happening. Instead of this Jesus fix that Abraham had or could not have, he had faith in what God was going to do, and that God was going to make good on His word. Now let's think about some of the heroes of the faith. Noah and David and Elijah, just to name a couple, they didn't have the 90-minute experience that we have today. They had the faith that can equip a shepherd boy to become a king. They had the kind of faith that it takes to call down fire from heaven. They had the kind of faith that it takes to build an ark to preserve all of humanity at the age of 600 years old. Now listen to this. We have gotten, in 2024, we have gotten so Charmin Ultra Soft in our faith that some of us have to be told to worship Right? We have gotten so soft in our faith. And I say our because it's me too. I'm not, it's not just me dogging on you because I've got the microphone. It's me. It's me. Ask any minister and they'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, it's sometimes it's hard to pray. Sometimes it's hard to fast. Sometimes it's hard to stay obedient. But those times that you don't feel like coming to church, the times that you don't feel like worshiping, the times that you don't feel like pursuing after God are the exact moments that you need to pursue him the most. Now, I want to speak to the men for a second. Men, do you know why your marriage is falling apart? Do you know why you're so stressed out? Do you know why you can never seem to catch a break? And instead of saying, oh, oh me, oh my, and throwing a pity party, we need to ask ourselves, how's our prayer life? When is the last time I read my Bible? When is the last time that I sacrificed something for someone else. Better yet, pastor uses this all the time and he's in the room, so I'm going to point him out. If you were to be charged in court of being a man of God or a woman of God, would there even be enough evidence to convict you 
of being a man or woman of God? How about this? And unfortunately, I done I told Katie, I was like, hey, I'm gonna use you as a sermon illustration. And unfortunately, it's just us uh, on a camera, so I cannot. But think about it, for real. When is the last time that you laid hands on your wife to pray over her? Now, I don't, I don't mean pray for her. I mean pray over her. You want a successful marriage, all you married or unmarried seeking people, you want a good marriage, you plead the blood of Jesus over your husband or wife or future thereof. You want your kids to come to know Christ, you plead the blood of Jesus over them. And when I say pray over your wife, I don't mean the laying in bed, nodding off, you know, Lord, bless my wife. I don't mean that. I mean for real. Look around on the news about everything that's going on. It is now. The times that, you know, people talked about 20, 30 years ago when they said, oh, times will get tough. Your faith's going to be tested. Brother, it's now. The time for being soft and letting somebody else do it is over. No more is the time of, I'm going to call pastor and have him pray for my marriage. That's not wrong. But you have the same spirit of God in you that I have, that Pastor Zach has, that so-and-so down the road has. So when you take ownership and say, enough's enough. Devil, you cannot have my kids. You cannot have my wife. I plead the blood of Jesus over my entire household. Things will start to change for you. Will you say, well, brother, how do you, how do you know that? How can you be so sure that all I've got to do is plead the blood of Jesus and everything's going to be all right? That's faith, honey. Will bad things happen? Yeah, people pass away. People fall away from faith. As sad as it is, it's a fact. It happens. When you pray over your kids and over your wife, like I said, it's not this little passive, Lord, touch them, and then fall asleep or watch YouTube videos about how to work on cars. I mean, bust out that oil. Get it all up on your hands. And you lay your hands on your wife's head or your husband's head and your kids' head and the, the threshold of the door, the couch, the bed, anything. When you, for real, plead the blood of Jesus over your home, I can promise you things will start to turn around for you. When you put your unrestricted faith in Christ. Right now, it's a time to stand and strengthen your faith as you stand on the promises of God. Verse 20, again, it says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now, you'll say, well, you know, it says no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith, and some people would stop. Oh, he grew strong as he what? Gave glory to God. When you, when you go to the gym, I know, I need to. Luckily, there's no one in here to laugh at me, and I'm going to pretend that no one did. But when you go to the gym, your goal is to get stronger, to get fitter, live a better life. Why don't we look at the church as a gym anymore, Brother Jordan? You want to 
grow spiritually, show up to church, pray, fast, seek after the Lord. Time's now, folks. And all of that to say this, it is as we give glory to God. If you go to the gym and you just whimsically move around and put minimal effort here, minimal effort there, you might see a little bit of results, but wait until something happens and you need that strength and you ain't got it. But when you start to give glory to God, in your faith, it will change. It'll change the way your marriage is. It'll change the way that your kids behave. It'll change your work environment. It'll change your career, the outlook on life. Some people say, you know, those of you that know, there's a situation going on in our family that is devastating and I had somebody a, a, a good friend of mine that um, that I work with we were talking about it and he said you know you say all these things are happening but yet it's like it's un it doesn't bother you I was like dude it bothers me a lot but I know that God will push me through whatever situation this is. He's like, well, how can you, how can you do that? How can you just be so confident that life's not just going to fall apart at your feet? I looked at him and I was like, dude, I don't know that, but I know that the Lord will provide. It's like he did for Abraham. Abraham. The Lord will provide. So when you trust in him and really trust in him, trust in him with your money, trust in him with your time. You know, these these phones, funny enough, they're incredibly advanced technology. We think of it as a piece of metal or plastic, and it's just nothing. But these phones can communicate to other human beings thousands of miles away. And we have created these things for good, to communicate. It's, it's awesome to have community and to communicate. But when you're on your feed on Instagram or Facebook, you're ingesting everything that's on there. It is being soaked in. Your eyes are seeing it. That's why it says to to guard your eyes, guard your ears. It wouldn't say to guard these things if they weren't important things to guard. Now, back to the, it's time to stop waiting on someone. I This is in my notes like three times. Because this is how the Lord just was like beating it in my head. It's time to stop waiting. It's time to stop waiting on someone else to do it for you. It's time to stop waiting for pastor to call you or for so-and-so to call you and say, brother, do you need to pray? Yes, that's encouraging, and I love it. That's a great shepherd. Even if you're not a member of this house and you go to a different church and your pastor calls you or texts you and checks on you, that is a blessing. And don't ever take it for granted. But some, we shouldn't, they shouldn't have to tell you. People that preach and post videos on YouTube that have good intentions, that encourage you to pray, yes, encouraging is one thing. But when someone has to tell you over and over and over and over again to pray, to seek God, to read the Bible, kind of comes to a point of, do you even really want the change? There comes a point where rubber meets the road and you've got to hit your knees and pray and seek after God and let him do it in your life. The Bible says that we've got one mediator 
between God and man. And that is Jesus Christ. It's time for to stop waiting on someone to tell you to worship. And I'll get off the waiting spill after this. But this is a big one for me. It's a big deal when we're having to be cheerleaded around to, to pray and to worship. Yes, it's hard sometimes. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. Sometimes I don't feel like waking up in the middle of the night and praying. You know, sometimes if Katie and I are having an argument, and I'm, unfortunately, she's right about a lot, right? All my married men said, amen. But I have to stop myself and realize that whether I'm right or wrong, I have to live the rest of my life with this woman, with these kids. So why not take care of what God's given me and pray over them? We did it the other day, and it was it was uncomfortable. But we were have it wasn't even a fight; it was just an argument. Two kids, you know what I mean? And I stopped midway, and I was like, let's pray right now. Yeah. Funny enough, it stopped after that. But when we have to be told to pray, and I've heard it, and I don't think they mean ill will about it, but when people is like, you've got to act Pentecostal, we shouldn't have to be told to act how we are. We shouldn't have to be told to honestly do the bare minimum and just show up. If you get here, God will do the rest. There's no pretending. You can fake it all you want, but when it's time to look at the fruits, someone's going to see that the scale was a little off balance. So, that was what is faith in a roundabout Stephen way of explaining it. But now, like, why? Why faith? Why not works? And I want to highlight two portions of Scripture here. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, and Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says... For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So I'm going to say it again. Why faith? Why is faith such a big deal? Why is it saved by grace through faith, not by works? Well, it's because God understands us. God gets us. And I'm not talking about that lousy Super Bowl commercial. God created you. He created me, and he created everything that there ever is, was, or was going to be. So, to say that he gets us is plainly obvious. He knows us. 
And there's five things in Genesis 12, one through three, that, that God said, he says, I will. God says, I will. God says, I will show you. God says, I will make you a great nation or make of you a great nation. God says, I will bless you. God says, I will bless those who bless you. And God also says, I will curse those who curse you. Now that's three scriptures. I don't know how many sentences that is, but that's only five I will statements from God. Now, these are things that he says he will do, but why doesn't God say more? Why doesn't he just spill out the whole plan of Abraham's life? Well, why don't he tell us everything that he's got in store for us in our lives? Well, it's not that he's withholding from you. God isn't trying to tease you with the future. But God knows. He gets you. He knows that if he told you everything that you were ever going to be, if he told you the, the purest form of your call, if he laid it out right in front of you, you would, A, brag about your situation and flip it and like, look what I did. But does Ephesians not say explicitly that it's by grace through faith, not by works, so no one can boast? So listen, when God says that I will do something, You put a magnet on that promise and put it right on your fridge where you see it every day. So he knows that you'd brag about it and make it all about you. We do that with (laughs) little things. So imagine if he told us the absolute truth. So when Jesus was talking to the disciples, when he was talking to Peter, and he's like, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He doesn't also say, Yo, by the way, you're going to get killed for this. All of you are going to die for this faith. Stick with me. If If Jesus said that to them or said it to you, if he said, sister, you're going to go, you're going to work in the mission field, you're going to have a great ministry, God's going to use you abundantly, but five years from now, you're going to get brutally executed for your faith. Odds are you would not do it. Now, that is not God saying that I'm going to withhold this from you, therefore you go do it. But God wants you to do what he's called you to do regardless of the circumstances. You might be in a season of waiting right now, but God is preparing a place for you. We're talking crock pot, not microwaves. We're not throwing it in there for 30 seconds to nuke it. We're putting it in there on low for eight hours and cooking that thing slow. And it's better when it comes out of a crock pot. I've never tried to make a roast in a microwave, but I can assume it probably don't taste as good as, as mama's Mississippi hot roast with the peppers in it. It tastes great because it was in the crock pot waiting and marinating and absorbing everything until it was time to take it out. Right now, you may be in a season of God, you hear God saying no, but God is really trying to tell you not right now. And B, for the reasons why he doesn't tell you everything that he's got in plan for you, is because we would go out of our way, mess it up. I was told a story 
and it's pretty relatable to me as well, of a man. He was, he felt the call of God to, to preach, he had, to be a pastor, to preach the word. And he said that instantly when he felt that call of God, felt he, he went online and found a seminary that was closest to him and he applied for it. He went and did all these things that he thought was what was going to push him into the ministry. And that's true. Seminary is important. I'd like to go one day. But when it boils down to it, you don't need it. It's nice. Helpful. It's a tool. It's a resource. Use every resource at your advantage. But just because you go to school, just because you pursue this thing, pursue this training, maybe not even about preaching, but you do all of these things like a prerequisite in college that you think is propelling you forward, but really you're missing God's still small voice in your head, whispering to you, telling you what to do, because you think that I need a degree to do this. I need, I need the training, the experience. I need the pieces of paper that say I'm qualified. God equips who he calls. He doesn't call someone. Yes, he, he can. But if you do go to seminary and pursue all this training, but you're not called of God, there comes a time in your ministry where it's going to plateau. And you're going to wonder why. Why can't I reach those people? Why aren't people coming to this church? Why aren't these things happening? But it's because God was telling you the whole time what you needed to do. But in our flesh, we were too busy doing what we thought was right. Genesis 3, it says that Eve saw the tree, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the fruit was good to eat, and she took it. She thought that that tree was good to eat, although God told them, do not eat that tree, the fruit that comes from that tree. But she thought that that's what she needed to do. And the same is with us now. God is whispering in your ear, just wait, just hold on, keep pressing keep praying, keep fasting, keep pleading the blood. But we're missing it because we're off doing what we think is going to propel us forward. That is why it's got to be faith. When these people that are contrary to God say that faith is blind, that we're just believing in something we can't see, one, Romans 1 says that everything that God has created is evidence that there is a God. You can't look out into this wonderful, beautiful world that God has created and say that something exploded, or sorry, that nothing exploded and turned into something. God created. When God wanted to create the world, he spoke it. It didn't just whimsically happen. It was intentful. That is why it has to be faith. And just like Abraham, it says that nothing made him waver in his faith because he was standing on the promise of God. And what he had for him, what God had for him in his life. You have got to remove the you from the God equation. And what I mean by that is this this you, the you that lives in your head, the you that you don't tell anyone about. 
that's the you that you've got to replace. You've got to replace that worry, that fear, that doubt, that depression, that anxiety, all of that. You've got to replace it and, re and in its place put faith. It has got to be faith. Pastor, I don't know how you want to end this, but I want to, to lead a prayer before we go. That someone's faith in the promise that God has given them be restored. You may have felt God lay a word on your heart or lay a call on your life and you're just waiting, Lord, I don't know what to do. Is this even your will for me? I want to pray specifically for you tonight that God has a call on your life, and you're waiting, and you're feeling discouraged in the waiting. I want to pray for you tonight. Lord, we just come to you right now in the name that is above every other name, Lord, this individual, I don't know who it is, but Lord, that is so plainly in my face. This person needs a touch of God. Lord, they have felt a call on their life. And Lord, they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And they're getting discouraged. Lord, send the Holy Spirit to encourage them right now in Jesus' name. Lord, that every spirit of fear, every spirit of discouragement, every spirit of depression has to flee in Jesus' name. And we are believing in your promise for this person and for all of us, Lord, that what you said and what you did for us on the cross, Lord, we have faith that that will carry us through. And we believe in the finished work of the cross in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.